Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Leonard Osongo. I work for a national NGO by name Cameroon Wildlife uh, Conservation Society. But before then, I've been working for the past 25 years with uh, WWF, IUCN, and a host of other international organizations. So I will be taking you through a couple of slides on uh, an area in Cameroon, far north region of Cameroon, uh, bordering Chad and Nigeria. Um, in a broader landscape, uh, the Lake Chad Basin, which is made up of Nigeria, Cameroon, Chad, and Niger Republic. Uh, we, we've been uh, doing, carrying out some studies in this area, which covers about, uh, let's say, in terms of population, it's about 3.5 uh, million inhabitants. And for protected areas, we've got three key protected areas in this region. That's Kalamalue, which you find right up here, uh, Waza and Kalifu, which, is, which were in the process of uh, gazetting as a national park. Um, I'll t probably take you through quickly on the socioeconomic context of the area, the people, the wildlife. It's mostly savanna ecosystem. So you've, in terms of wildlife, you've got giraffes, elephants, and all the savanna species that you might think of. Um, as I said, the population of the area is about 3.5 million. People are mostly uh, nomads, cattle, herders. Um, in terms of uh, livelihood, where the average household in income less than a hundred pounds or let's say a hundred dollars a year. So the people are really, really poor. Um, for the elephant study, we've been studying elephants in this area for the past, um, but since 2009. Um, our studies basically focused on looking at the movement patterns of these elephants and the conflicts between their movements, their basic needs, and also the activities of the communities around or living in the area. Um, from the map, you realize there, <coughs> from these studies, we some sort of mapped out the elephant, where you've got the conflicts between the villages and the elephants. Um, but more importantly, uh, looking at the mitigating actions, how do we deal with this conflict, especially in a situation where there is prevailing insecurity. That's really the issue we are facing in this era with this uh, Islamic sect known as uh, Boko Haram. So this is really the, 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 the biggest challenge we are facing. It's no longer about land use planning and all whatnot, but it's more of survival because of the increasing activities of this Islamic group that spreads across Nigeria, Niger, Chad, and now the far north region of uh, Cameroon. So our biggest challenge is no longer looking at some of the, the corridors, the conflicts, but how do we deal with the security issues around the human, in addition to the human wildlife conflicts that the people are already facing. There are more than 250,000 people who are internally displaced in this area from their homes due to the activities of uh, Boko Haram. So again, um, a couple of slides on the conflict areas where you find in, in red, where we've dotted in red, uh, uh, those areas where you've got some of the highest concentrations of uh, conflicts. But you also have in some of the areas in our studies where there are elephants and there are no conflicts. So um, it's a whole mix. Some of those, the most prominent problems we've got in terms of human elephant conflicts, the destruction of farmlands, um, but also, we recorded some killings. 
Between 2011 and 2019, um, we recorded about nine people who were killed from, uh, due to human-elephant conflicts. That's way, way beyond the numbers that have been recorded through uh, the Boko Haram conflicts, because I think from the official figures, more than 2,000 people have lost their lives from the activities of uh, Boko Haram. So that's more serious than even what we are talking here. These are some of the cases that uh, we recorded people who are some sort of either attacked by the elephants in their farms, uh, but they are also, uh, imp uh, the, uh, the, the elephant conflicts also are impacting the wildlife, not just the elephants, but the wildlife conflicts in general. We've got cases where people have lost their cows from, from lions attack and also from the militant groups. About six cows were recorded in one village and five in another. The total amount is, well, might say it's small, but that's a lot of money for those communities. $2,000, that's quite a lot of money. There are also infrastructural damages caused by human elephant conflicts in, in the region. We've seen the cases of uh, mango orchards that are destroyed, fishing canals that are also destroyed by the elephants. So again, we are, we are looking at what could be the practical solutions to these problems, wildlife, human conflicts, but how to integrate this with the increasing dynamics and the existing dynamics with uh, the activities of Boko Haram. That's really the difficult equation. How do we navigate through all this? Reconciling the needs of the people, looking at the elephant issues in terms of corridors, land use planning, but most importantly, dealing with this with increasing insecurity in the region. Um, the government of Cameroon and in general Central African region, especially within the Lake Chad Basin, have come up with a couple of solutions. Uh, well, <clears throat> part of it is uh, they go into these areas to kill the elephants. Well, it could be a short term, to us we think those are short term solutions to the problem. Because killing the elephants is not really the issue, but how do you really put in place long-term strategies of managing the issue. So um, there's this quick way out that each time the villagers complain or talk about uh, elephants destroying their farms, what the government does is uh, they authorize for killings. And as simple as that, which is not really a long-term solution to the problem. Yeah, we also have techniques that are being, the local NGOs are involved in training of uh, the villagers or the communities in using techniques like the wild paper techniques, which I guess most of you are aware of. Um, they deploy these uh, techniques or these wild paper in their farms or spread them around um, to some sort of chase away the, the elephants. Um, again, there are more modern techniques with uh, the use of uh, mobile phones, where you can, uh, we've succeeded in training a couple of villagers, but again, unfortunately, we lost one of them last year from uh, uh, the Boko Haram sect. Where you go into your farmlands or wherever, and then you, where you've, you can record the data on any elephant damages or damages caused or sites where elephants have some sort of de <coughs> destroyed your farmland or whatever, and then, at the field base, there's a desktop where you can basically send this information through SMS. But it's a nice technology, but the challenge there is uh, how, yeah, the capacity to train the people on the use of mobile phones to collect data and get this downloaded at a more secure place on a desktop for data analysis and so on and so forth. So it's a little bit challenging, but we think it's quite another very effective and adaptive way of monitoring human elephant or human wildlife conflicts in the area. Uh, I already mentioned to you about the problems with uh, 
the insecurity problems in general within the region, particularly with uh, the Boko Haram sect, which, as I said, um, it's really the number one priority in terms of what do we do on handling and dealing with the issues of human wildlife conflicts as against land use planning and other um, immediate or short-term strategies that can be put in place. Uh, these are just a couple of slides talking about some of the solutions which we are already implementing or in the process of doing that. We encourage effective participation and support of local communities. Uh, in elephant conservation initiatives set up a damage compensation mechanism. This is something we some sort of worked out with the government, even though it's not uh, due to resources, because more and more resources are put in, invested in the security problems than the livelihood of the people. Um, improved game ranger, I mean, it's, as I said, uh, we've got three protected areas, um, understaffed, under-equipped, limited supply, so that's truly a problem. Then the Boko Haram extremists, who are very active in the region, they are recruiting more and more youths, and that's also another problem. How do we some sort of dissuade the youths from joining this group and really focus on doing either livelihood or conservation work? That's uh, equally another challenge. Um, yeah. Complete participatory land use planning, that's something we've, we've been working on. And again, as of now, a little bit compromised due to the security concerns. Uh, upgrading the critical corridors that have been identified, putting them in conservation or giving them greater protection and community awareness, enforcing wildlife laws. Um, promoting uh, livelihood initiatives. Again, I think that's where we will be focusing over the next two years or so in order to some sort of dissuade the youths from being attracted by the, the more enticing packages that Boko Haram provides these youths. So on that note, uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, Ned, if you'd like to stay by the microphone, we could be time for a question or two. Yeah, Chris. Hi, thanks for that, which was very interesting. Um, I did some work in that area in Kaeli about 30 years ago. And there, uh, the thing that was most noticeable was that the crop raiding was being done by extremely large herds of elephants, in that case, about 200 at one time. So my question is, is that still the case? Are they still crop raiding in large herds? And what's the implication of that? Because it's a very different situation from what happens almost anywhere else, as far as I know, in Africa. So how does that affect the kind of mitigation measures that we'd use if, if it's still the case? OK, thank you for your question, Kaile. Yeah, it's still the case to some extent. But unfortunately, for the elephant population, I didn't mention that uh, the elephant population in the area has significantly dropped. I can say for the past five years, probably more than half the population within the entire landscape it has gone due to illegal hunting by the Boko Haram uh, individuals. So it's still very much the case. But uh, most of the communities of the people are displaced, and again, uh, what the attention now is, is more focused on the security concerns than even looking at the damages caused by the elephants. Thank you. That touches on. A, I had a question: Are the Boko Haram poaching? Yeah, a lot. I mean, they, they are basically the ones doing the poaching they for the yeah for meat and also for the ivory. So, no, another question there. Yeah. Hi, Leonard. Uh, thank you for for. Your... Okay. Uh, thank you for your talk. Very interesting. I'll um I'll ask, uh, I'll ask a question. Maybe it's too simple, but I'm not an expert in in this field. So you talked about um, sending alerts to mobile phones to um, protect people uh, against these conflicts. 
I'm just wondering how does that protect uh, other things than, than lives? So I guess that you receive an alert that a uh, herd of elephants are coming, and you can ex escape or, 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 or whatever you want to do. But if, is there a measure to protect crops or livestock or uh, cars? I didn't really get the last part of your question, sorry. Yeah, are alerts sent to devices able to protect other than human or livestock lives? No, well, unfortunately not, okay. not able. But again, if I got you right, um, for the use of these uh, techniques, basically for monitoring purposes, because we realize it was difficult to move around the entire area. It's quite vast. We don't also have the resources, even the government, to do that. So we some sort of embarked on training what we call uh, youth vigilante groups, who so, uh, they are basically volunteers who go out there if, if, if there are any damages or any information with regards to attacks by elephants or lions or wildlife in general, they can pick it Pick, the, pick up the data on their phones and send it to, by SMS, uh, to the wildlife rangers uh, who now download this data. We can now do the analysis. But as I said, the problem we are facing with this technology or this method basically is the capacity of the people to, to collect this data and also the security challenges that we are facing, where most, most people with the death of this guy who was probably one of the most dynamic in the region, many people are scared of going out there and getting data.